Good morning. And welcome to the First Unitarian Church on this, our 127th anniversary. This church has ruffled some feathers in this valley along the way in these past 127 years. We don't do this intentionally. It just happens in the course of our always wanting to be good stewards in the public realm. The important decisions throughout our history and into our current times in which we live have all been unavoidably political decisions. Whether there be peace or war, freedom or totalitarianism, racial equality or discrimination, homophilia or homophobia, food or famine. Now, these are political decisions which stand at the center of our faith. And unlike some other houses of worship who place political decisions somewhere on the, the periphery of their faith, we have been unafraid to enter the fray, enter the fray on behalf of the poor, on behalf of the powerless and voiceless, on behalf of justice, on behalf of peace. symbol of light and of knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. May we open our service, turning our hymn books, please, to number 187.
To be human is to be imbued with the spirit of discovery, which is curiosity met with intellect and imagination. One of the great discoverers, Galileo Galilei, is thought to have said, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. In a world in which an alarming and growing number of humans believe the earth is flat and the earth herself chokes under the oppression of climate change denial, it is so important that the spirit of discovery be encouraged by any means. To engage in discovery is holy work, and science is nothing less than the work of seeking the divine. After all, as Galileo also said, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. What is ancient, what is modern, and what is as yet unimagined are all part of who we are. We cannot leave any of these behind. And yet, they all pale before what is eternal. There are those who say that unity with the eternal is the end of all discovery, and perhaps they are right, but we may be certain that we aren't there yet. We have a long way to go, and we will be rewarded for our searching. Please join with me in a spirit of prayer, meditation, or reflection. Spirit of discovery, who lights our imagination and feeds our hunger for knowledge, you are known by many names. Today we call you mystery. We do not ask for answers so much as for good questions. We do not ask for certainty so much as for wonder. We ask that you reveal yourself to us as that which is beyond comprehension, for no God that we can measure or define is worthy of praise. We ask you, bringer of light, to light the whole world with wisdom and understanding. Let ignorance and fear vanish in the sun. And may all the people of the world collaborate and share what they have to learn so that all may live in peace. Amen.
This morning's reading comes from Unitarian Universalist minister Jack Mendelson, a champion for social justice issues during his very long ministry and a person of immense courage and expansive vision. For us, salvation is not an otherworldly journey flown on wings of dogma. It is ethical striving and moral growth, respect for the personalities and experiences of others, faith in human dignity and potentiality, aversion to sanctimony and bigotry, reverence for the gift of life, confidence in a true harmony of mind and spirit, of nature and human nature, faith in the ability to give and receive love, and a quest for broad, encompassing religious expression, spiritual yet practical, personal and communal. This is what we mean when we say we believe in salvation by character. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say that we believe that salvation is character. For we do not mean that character saves us from the flames of hell or takes us to the bliss of heaven. We do not profess to know, as a community of faith, the precise dimensions of immortality. But we are sure of this, the inner life, shaped by power of high and sane ideals, brings to human souls the finest, most enduring satisfactions and makes of our humanity a source of strength, even in utmost tribulation. This is what we mean by salvation, and what serves so well in life could not possibly serve less well in afterlife. We believe that our humanness is punished by our sins, not for them, and that the evil we do lives with us. By the same token, we believe that we are enriched by our virtues and that the good we do lives with us and beyond us as a benediction of peace in our own lives and in the life of humanity. We believe that corporate religion, the church, has no higher object than to get us from Sunday to Monday, taking our Sunday professions into our Monday behavior. In short, when we talk of salvation, we talk of making, making religion a sustained and sustaining force in our daily lives. We do not say that religion has nothing to do with the afterlife, but we do say that it has everything to do with this life.
I want to thank David, who has really risen to the occasion this morning, because as we discussed uh, kind of the subject for this morning, the theme of um, the modern spirit, embracing the modern spirit, I kind of challenged him to take us out of our conventional, traditional mode of listening and uh, present us with something, you know, maybe a little irritable. Get us, you know, shake us, shake us free from our normal way of listening. And so I just, I'm saying this so I don't want you to think that the piano is out of tune or <laughs> David has made a lot of mistakes. Uh, this was, this was all, this was all planned. Of course, if he did make mistakes, we'd never know it, but that's our, <laughs> that's not what it's all about. David, thanks. Thanks a lot. We've got a, a few announcements this morning. Uh, be sure to take a look at the wealth of announcements in your order of service. And I do want to say, first and foremost, that next Sunday is a big day in the liturgical life of this church. It is Celebration Sunday. It is a time where, with great joy and pride, we kick off our pledge drive for the 2018-2019 year, this year. And we have a very special guest who will grace our pulpit, Lily Eskelson, who um, is president of the NEA, the National Education Association. Before that, she was, uh, she kind of worked away. way up. Before that, she was a uh, uh, secretary and treasurer. And before that, she was president of UEA. And before that, she was teacher of the year here in Utah. And before that, she was just a simple sixth grade ordinary teacher and uh, my goodness we are we just uh, love the uh, the ladder she has climbed she was a, a very very prominent member of this congregation it's going to be wonderful to to have her back here next sunday and for those who are pretty new i don't know what when, when did lily leave maybe some 15 20 years ago um it's going to be a kick for you to get introduced to uh, to lily so that's next sunday Please be on hand. Also, this Sunday, uh, be sure to stop by the endowment table. Kathy Chambliss has some exciting news to share with you. It's also a little educational, and that is uh, through some generous funding, um, your contribution to the endowment will, in fact, receive matching funds. And so you may want to learn a little bit more about how how that works. It's intriguing. It's actually very easy, and uh, just learn a little more about that. Coming up on uh, March 8th, the young adult group and I will have a meeting up in the, um, uh, the Haven uh, at 730, and if you are a young adult, please be on hand for that. Also want to remind you that um, the coming of age kids are doing some fundraising and are putting together a wonderful breakfast with Dr. Seuss. You may want to be on hand for that. On March 25th, let's take ahead. If you have a young child or a baby who you'd like to have part of the dedicating dedication service, or you're planning on having a baby before March 25th, um, <laughs> let me know. Let Amanda know and. Uh, We'd like to include your child uh, as well. At this time, the offering will gratefully be received, a chance to greet one another and bid each other a warm, welcome, good morning. In April, 
of 1891, just two months following the establishment of this church in Salt Lake City, one of our country's biggest heresy trials was underway in New York City. The Presbytery of New York took formal actions against its most prominent biblical scholar, Charles Briggs. Now, Briggs was not just a run-of-the-mill minister, but he was also a revered faculty member of Union Theological School in New York, which was in the vanguard of introducing progressive interpretations of scripture. Now, when our church first opened its doors in uh, 1891, 127 years ago, the religious climate of our nation was fraught with tension between religious traditionalists and religious progressives, a divide that really hasn't narrowed much since all this time. But the issue at the time that this church was founded focused on the, the introduction of a whole new theological discipline called biblical criticism. Now Briggs had done his graduate work in Germany where the theological schools, especially in Tübingen, as far back as the 1820s, sought to bring about a, a balance and, and, and in perspective, a balance in religion, reconciling demands of human reason with all those preposterous claims of scripture. As a theological student, Briggs learned to, to blend biblical criticism with um, a bit of theological reflection. The tool used most effectively in this endeavor is called biblical exegesis. It entailed, and is still in progress today in a lot of, uh, excuse me, still in use today in a lot of progressive seminaries, examines the scriptural text with the intent of a proper interpretation. Because as we know, you know, scripture does, does make some rather broad, sweeping statements. And so the exegetical students asks, what was happening historically at that time? What were, the, what were the cultural norms at that time? And how accurate, how accurate really was the, the translation from the original? So when Briggs returned to the States, brimming with German progressive scholarship, he realized that absolutely no biblical criticism could be found anywhere in the United States. And he went so far as to say that criticism, criticism itself was a scare word in our country. How true is that still today? The current iteration of the Republican Party seeks to curtail critical investigations into the environment, sexual harassment, gun legislation, and all those staples of traditional religious thought where women must obey husbands, slaves obey masters, and the gay life used as, viewed as an abomination. Taking a critical view of the much heralded traditional virtues and beliefs remains a scary concept for a huge part of our American population today, enough to garnish an electoral vote victory in the last presidential election. So if that's going on now, imagine Briggs back in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, trying to impress upon his colleagues and the American culture generally that their, their resistance to critical thinking and critical views of scripture signaled an alarmingly outdated view. But he received tremendous pushback. The single largest argument, which I'm sure it's still being used today and is quite familiar to us, 
The argument was that liberal religion simply allowed people to believe anything they wanted. And that, of course, would not be tolerated. I mean, how often today are we uh, accused of, oh, Unitarianism, yeah, believe whatever you want. What's, what's the big deal? That argument's been around for a long time. Only fidelity to traditional Christian tenets, church authorities argued, could prevent the dilution of Christian life to the point of being unrecognizable. Neatly folded into Christian orthodoxy was the required faith in Christ's return to establish a millennial kingdom. And where was this kingdom supposed to take place? Jerusalem. Christ would one day return to Jerusalem. Our nation, recognizing Jerusalem now as the capital city of Israel, caters to this traditional faith of evangelicals today, the heart of the president's base, still alive and well and cracking today. So this eschatological view proved deeply troubling to Briggs, along with the accompanying belief in, in any moment secret rapture. He accused the traditionalists of overbelief. There's really no such word as overbelief, but I think we'd agree there should be such a word as overbelief. <laughs> nothing, nothing captures the unrelenting faith as truth blather than regarding it simply as overbelief. Even now, the year 2018, we know exactly what Briggs meant. Briggs urged a modern theology, theology in which he tried to educate his brethren that Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible. Ezra did not write the Chronicles, nor did he even write the book of Ezra. Jeremiah did not write the Kings or Lamentations. David, well, he may have written a few Psalms, but certainly not the whole enchilada. Solomon did not write the Song of Songs or Ecclesiastes. And Isaiah did not write half the book that bears his name. Briggs referred to biblical inerrancy as a means to frighten little children. He contended, much like the Unitarian transcendentalists, that nothing essential would be lost to Christianity if all biblical miracles were to be explained on natural ground. He posited that scripture, the church, and reason were the three great fountains of divine authority. And then he got into a whole lot of trouble by citing the British Unitarian James Martineau as an exemplar of rational religion. Martineau was a highly influential Unitarian professor of morals at Manchester College where British Unitarians are still being trained for the ministry today. And about the same time that Ralph Waldo Emerson delivered his infamous Divinity School address in which he tore down virtually every facet of traditional Christian belief, Martineau published a book called Rationale of Religious Inquiry. He pursued reason reason as a viable religious tool rather than, than regard religion as some idle metaphysical speculation. Once again, historically, we see the battle unfold between those who cling to traditionalism and those who, who wish to move forward to embrace the modern spirit. Now, when I hear Briggs proclaim that traditional Christian ways of thinking about religion, traditional ways of thinking about the world were no longer credible. I immediately think of Pope Francis trying to move the Catholic Church into modern times. Vatican traditionalists with their pre-scientific worldviews 
try to block the Pope at every turn. They are intent on prescribing a moral view of life designed to scare little children, guaranteed. Now Briggs, he debated colleagues as well as the leadership of the Presbyterian Church. He argued that traditionalists were actually failing Christianity because they were denying the Holy Ghost. He said, how else was one to explain their refusal to learn anything from modern science, historical criticism, and humanist morality? The divine spirit, he claims, has been active. It's been active all these decades, all these centuries. And new creeds are needed to, to spark a, a new reformation of the church. Charles Briggs was found guilty of heresy by the Presbytery in their national convention in August 1891. Biblical criticism was taught in Germany, actually beginning in the 1820s, and it proved the, the genesis of what motivated liberal theology to finally form some academic credentials. You know, rather, than, rather than treat liberalism as simply an, an idea that uh, looks at traditionalism as, as irrational and abhorrent, biblical criticism became an actual discipline, a formal academic discipline in German theology, which eventually made its way into some of the more progressive seminaries in this country. But what I want to do is share one of my favorite stories about biblical criticism and the Ralph Waldo Emerson family. Now, we've got to start with William Ellery Channing, who was really the, uh, the architect of American Unitarianism. It was against the advice of Channing, who was dead set against biblical criticism, because it, he thought that it was ultimately destructive to faith. But despite that, going against the advice of the great William Ellery Channing, William Emerson, Ralph's older brother, went to Tübingen to study German theology. And this occurred the same time Ralph entered Harvard Divinity School. William, however, also entertained ideas of becoming a Unitarian minister and got so excited about biblical criticism that he exhorted his younger brother, Ralph, to sail to Germany and study with him among all these simply amazing professors. Ralph, you got to get over here. You got to come to Germany. And Ralph said, Ralph said, nah, I don't want to learn German. Nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> After a year of study, or should I say exposure to biblical criticism, William returned to the States and told his little brother Ralph that he, William, could not in good conscience continue to study for the ministry. The, the historical, critical approach to religion had drained away his faith. So Channing was perhaps right in his assessment that faith cannot stand up to critical thinking. But here's what's so incredible. Before leaving Germany, William Emerson arranged a meeting with Goethe and asked Goethe what he should do to resolve this dilemma of losing faith while wanting to enter the ministry. Can you just imagine a conversation between Ralph Waldo Emerson's brother and Goethe? I'm wondering, did Goethe give him some kind of a, a, a Faustian deal or something like that? I, just, I don't know. But Goethe's response to young William was interesting. He basically told him, don't sweat it. There was no reason, oh, he did. there was no reason a minister couldn't keep his true beliefs and doubts to himself. Hmm, well... William was ready to buy into that. You tell, you tell the congregation you know, one thing about faith, but you're kind of reserving these, these inner doubts yourself. But on sailing home, 
his ship encountered a huge storm and nearly capsized. He began to pray. Biblical criticism be damned. That's not going to save him. <laughs> but his doubts still drove him crazy. And by the time he actually got back to Concord, he had reconsidered everything and decided to enter law school instead. Now, Mary Moody Emerson, Ralph and William's highly influential aunt, a real powerhouse of a woman who wanted her nephews to become old guard Unitarian preachers, lamented William's reprehensible decision to enter into the field of law. After listening to him explain the circumstances of his decision, she said, you may have lost your faith, William, but by entering law school, you have lost your virtue. <laughs> 127 years ago, yesterday to be precise, First Unitarian Church became a charter member of the American Unitarian Association and called the Reverend David Utter as its first minister. Utter, as it turned out, was a scholar in biblical criticism. He set Salt Lake City on fire with his extremely progressive views on scripture, God, and the role reason plays in, in reconciling religion with science. He could, he could well have served this congregation today with this thinking. Money was an issue for this church back then. Glad that's over. <laughs> <laughs> David Utter had to supplement his salary by teaching English at West High School. He left this pulpit after a few years and wound up as, as minister of the First Unitarian Society of Denver, where he stayed a pretty long time until 1917, when he sadly was relieved of his duties for what we would call today Alzheimer's. But his sermons during his prime sparked great excitement and were often printed in full in, in all the Denver newspapers. And during his ministry, the congregation really flourished. And while in Denver, he did, well, he did many remarkable things. One thing I want to point out in particular because of our pledge drive that's beginning next Sunday, what he did was abandon the, the rental of pews and replace that with pledge cards. This worked so well that the church could retire the $10,000 debt they incurred before Utter arrived there. So I hope that our pledge drive will be as successful as it was in Denver in 1900, or we may really mix things up and go back to um, renting pews. Who knows? <laughs> that would be different. That would shake things up. <laughs> Clearly, the the tensions between traditional and progressive points of view are not reserved for historical glimpses looking back. They represent flashpoints in every era, and we are saddled with these conflicting views in today's world. It's what divides us as a nation. And we're not the only nation torn between clinging to imagine greatness of past traditions on the one hand, and forward-looking idealists who want to embrace the modern spirit on the other hand. The challenge for us in this church, this church, which brought biblical criticism to the Salt Lake Valley back in 1891, our challenge is to keep redefining what it actually means to move forward, to get unstuck, to embrace the modern spirit. Two years ago, our guest speaker on Celebration Sunday was Rosemary Bray McNatt, president of 
Star King School, our UU Seminary in Berkeley. And we spent a, a marvelous lunch together while she was here discussing one simple question that I asked her. I said, Rosemary, how's it going? <laughs> well, um, she was facing a huge dilemma. Star King was preparing their ministerial students for a progressive religious movement. But our congregations, she said, were too far behind the students in understanding the, the zeitgeist moving forward in compelling ways. And so she said essentially there was a mismatch, a mismatch between the professional leadership that was being trained and the church body, which was stuck in its own system of traditionalism even among Unitarian Universalist congregations, stuck in our own traditional ways of worship and music, except for today, <laughs> while avoiding issues like diversity, racism, multiculturalism, so on and so forth. Newly minted ministers now were having great difficulties finding the right congregation. The ministers, these new ministers in the congregations were in such different levels of consciousness. Now, as we celebrate our church's 127th anniversary, which is an amazing accomplishment, 127 years here in Salt Lake City. Just think of that. I do want to say with all sincerity, that I am exceedingly proud of this congregation. You know, we made Salt Lake uncomfortable by introducing biblical criticism in 1891. And we're making Salt Lake uncomfortable today by introducing sanctuary, among other things. Sanctuary represents a huge step forward in embracing the modern spirit of inclusivity and multiculturalism. It's exactly what a church must be doing in these times. It's impressive that we have more than 200 volunteers working on this. Most of them, of course, are from our own congregation. But what's so astounding is that members of other houses of worship are seizing the opportunity to be a part of this church's movement in expanding its focus beyond traditional levels of comfort. And we frankly have been gearing up to this for a long time. Our Refugee Resettlement Committee, active for 20 years, has become a model which the IRC showcases around the country. I couldn't be more proud. Our many chefs and sous chefs who prepare and serve meals at the homeless teen shelter, our environmental ministry program, our solar panels right here on the roof, converting a sweet, traditional New England church look, moving us into the, the vanguard of alternative energy our only hope for the future, I am so proud. Now, we're not about biblical criticism any longer, and we cannot rest on having embraced the modern spirit in 1891. The funny thing is that the modern spirit keeps redefining itself, as it must. We are constantly challenged not only to, to keep up with an ever-changing religious focus, but to be leaders in moving this church and hopefully other churches into the vanguard. We are evolving. I believe that we're also aware of how much further we still have to go. And this awareness will only serve us well as we 
keep re-examining our readiness to make some profoundly needed progressive changes. It's our anniversary, and we can look back with pride on how we shook the foundations of biblical interpretation. Did it right here in this church. It's our anniversary, and so let's look forward. Let's look forward with pride in our, our basic disposition to embrace the modern spirit. We, as a congregation, are ready to launch and launch big. The future could not be brighter at this time in history for this church. I want to thank all of you for keeping, keeping us moving with the times. Amen. Let's close our service. Turning our hymn books, please, to number 345. As we extinguish the chalice, I'd like to conclude with these words by my mentor, William Sloan Coffin. He says, in almost every church, there are gentle cowards who think their gentleness offsets their cowardice. It doesn't. Compassion frequently demands confrontation. Compassion frequently demands confrontation, as all those 20th century movements illustrate. Now, the primary reason I suspect their views fail to prevail is because churches vastly prefer charity, which in no way affects the status quo. Churches prefer charity to justice, which immediately leads to political confrontation. And that's our position today on our 127th anniversary as we offer sanctuary. Why do we do it? Because we will never surrender the ethical call to justice.